Hi everyone, greetings again from Ganubi Baptist Church. It's Mark Morell here with a message from God's Word to encourage you today. No matter where you may be watching from, no matter what you may be going through circumstantially, I've been trusting and praying that God's Word is going to speak powerfully into your life and situation today. So welcome to each and every one of you. Well, we're into part three of our series in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24 and 25, which I've called The King is Coming. And of course, as the title suggests, it's a series focused on the second coming of Jesus. Now, just in case you may have missed uh, part one or part two, those broadcasts are available on the YouTube channel or, of course, on the Ganubi Baptist Church Facebook page or the website GanubiBaptist.com and you can catch up that way. But throughout history, Christ followers have lived with a sense of excitement and anticipation that this world is not the end. Uh, pain and suffering are not the end. Death is not the end. Jesus is coming back and He will make all things new. Well, today we look at the parable of the talents which has been described by some as one of the greatest parables of all time. It's a parable which speaks to wasted opportunity. And we are encouraged throughout Scripture to maximize our lives, to make the most of our gifts and talents and abilities, and to use the opportunities we have been given in life to grow in our relationship, to grow in our walk with God. Because as this parable teaches us, there is coming a time when we will give an account of how we used our talents, our gifts and our abilities. In other words, what God has entrusted us with. So with that in mind, let's turn in God's word to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 and we'll pick it up in verse 14. Matthew 25, 14. Let me read the verses to you and then I'll give you some background and context and we'll get started. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and went out and hid your gold in the, in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant! So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should, have, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, 
even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Challenging verses, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, I thank you again today for an opportunity to gather around your word. Thank you, Father, that your word is full of life-giving hope and challenge and encouragement and direction. And Lord, in these days, we desperately need to build our lives upon the wisdom of your word. And so, Father, for each person watching today, thank you that you love them. Thank you that you know them. Thank you, Father, that you've got a hope and a future for their lives. And Lord, I pray today that as we delve into these powerful principles, these powerful verses, that you would give us wide open hearts to receive and to respond to your word. Come Holy Spirit and teach us, we pray, in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, remember the context, this whole sermon uh, in Matthew 24 and 25, known as the Olivet Discourse, was triggered by a question the disciples asked Jesus in verse 3 of chapter 24. And this is the question. They asked him, when will this happen? Again, the context is the second coming of Jesus. When will this happen? And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? And of course, you'll remember that Jesus replied um, that no one knows. Uh, no human being, uh, no angelic being, not even Jesus himself, but only God the Father knows the exact day and hour of the second coming. Yes, there will be signs. Yes, there will be clues on many levels. And remember, we spoke about mass spiritual deception, wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes, pestilences, all those are listed in Matthew 24. And the Bible says these are the beginnings of birth pains. These are signs pointing to the end of the age and the second coming of Jesus. But the repeated warning in these chapters is that it will happen suddenly and unexpectedly. That analogy of a thief coming in the night. And so we need to be prepared we need to be ready. We need to be living every day in the light of that day when either Jesus comes or he calls us home, whichever comes first. So Jesus highlights this need for readiness by sharing two parables. The parable of the ten virgins, which we looked at a couple of weeks back, and this one, the parable of the talents. And the two parables are linked by verse 13, which says, Therefore, keep watch, be vigilant, because you do not know the day or the hour. This principle of being prepared, of being ready for the second coming of Jesus, which will happen unexpectedly and suddenly. But very interesting, the parable of the virgins has an emphasis on waiting, while this parable has an emphasis on working. Very interesting. So while we wait... While we live with a sense of excitement and anticipation, what are we to do? Well, we are meant to be working. We are meant to be living our lives, uh, maximizing our gifts, talents, and spiritual opportunities for the glory of God. So let's begin there in verse 14 by looking at the responsibility we've received. Verse 14 begins again, flowing from the previous parable. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So verse 14 sets the scene for us. You've got the owner of the estate. He's going to be going away for a period of time. And so he entrusts his wealth to his servants. Clearly he's hoping to keep up with the economy while he's away, make some wise economic investments. And so he entrusts his wealth to his servants. He entrusts them with responsibility. Interesting, that word servant in the original language is the word doulos. And so we're not talking here about some lowly ranked slave. Uh, we're talking here about employees. We're talking here about skilled people who the owner could trust with responsibility. He could trust with wealth. 
um, stewards who could effectively manage his property while he was away. We're talking here about capable people. And of course, I'm sure you've seen already, but the master in the parable is Jesus. The master going on a journey represents that time period between the first and the second coming of Jesus, the period of time in which we are living in. And we are the servants, we are the stewards entrusted with responsibility of managing talents, of managing opportunities, of maximizing resources until Jesus returns, bearing in mind that everything we have belongs to him. We are custodians, we are stewards of his resources. But something so interesting, notice in verse 15, that the master in the parable doesn't distribute his resources in equal amounts to his servants. In fact, we're told in verse 15, he gave to each servant according to their ability. So in other words, the servant's ability determined the amount he received from the master. Clearly, the master knows the capacity of each servant. He knows their levels of responsibility. He knows their levels of capability. And so he gives to each one, not something unrealistic, but he gives to each one what he believes they are capable of handling. To the first he gave five, to the second he gave two, and to the third he gave one. Now, when we think of that word talent, often we think of a skill or a gift. This person is talented. But in those days, a talent referred to something that could be weighed on a scale. Um, in fact, a talent was often referred to as 20 years worth of wages, a significant amount of money. Think of someone who earns a decent salary and then multiply that salary by 20. Uh, and that's the value of a talent. In fact, the NRV describes each talent as a bag of gold. There you have it, something that can be weighed, um, a significant amount of value, a significant amount of money. But the point Jesus is making is that all of us have been created differently. We've got different capacities, different capabilities in different areas, different skills, different talents, um, different life experiences, different upbringings, different levels of opportunity, different privileges. And friends, I encourage you to make peace with who you are. Don't ever make the mistake of comparing yourself to somebody else because that unhelpful comparison will only lead you to one of two places. It may lead you to a place of pride where you consider yourself to be better than somebody else. Or it could lead you to a place of discouragement where in your perception other people are better than you. I encourage you, be at peace with who you are. Be confident in your identity in Jesus and then go out and be the best you that you can be to the glory of God. There's such freedom in being your authentic self, not trying to be somebody else, but being exactly who God has made you to be, bearing in mind He knows your capability, He has given you exactly what you need to maximize your potential and to maximize your ability. So what opportunities do you enjoy? Or what opportunities have you enjoyed as far as your relationship with God is concerned? Often I think about our local church here in Ganubi and the wide open door we often take for granted. So many opportunities to learn about Jesus, to grow in our walk with God, to, to meet other Christ followers. So iron can sharpen iron as one man sharpens another. Um, so think about the opportunities you've received along the way in terms of spiritual growth. Then think about your education. Think about the skills, the abilities, the spiritual gifts that you have. Think about material resources. What are you sitting with today? What is God entrusted to you? Because each one of us has a bag. Let's call that bag a stewardship bag. Not a bag of gold as in the parable, but a stewardship bag full of different things that we are responsible for. A bag of privilege, a bag of responsibility that we need to be maximizing, that we need to be living out. Well, back to the parable. How do the servants respond 
to the bag of gold, to the talent that the master had given them. Well, verse 16, we read this. The man who had received five bags of gold, in other words, five talents, went at once, put his money to work, and gained five more bags. A 100% return on investment. Exactly the same with the second in verse 17. The one with two bags of gold gained two more. Another 100% return on investment. Now we're not told what they did to gain that return, but the point is they, those two servants represent maximum commitment. They represent people who make the most of their spiritual resources and opportunities, people who move beyond average, people who live with a spirit of excellence to the glory of God. But what about the third servant? He was very different to the first two, clearly. Have a look at verse 18. But the man who had received one talent or one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Hmm. So unlike the other two servants, the third servant does absolutely nothing with the opportunity he's received from the master. Well, in verse 19, the master returns from his long journey to settle accounts with his servants. He checks on how they've done with the privileges and responsibilities he's entrusted to them. And friends, that's the point of the parable. When Jesus returns, that's exactly what he's going to do with us. What have we done with all he has given to us? What have we done with all he's entrusted to us? Have we used those resources? Have we used those God-given abilities and talents and opportunities to serve God, to serve others, to advance the kingdom of God? Well, in this particular parable, two servants proved to be genuine servants, while the third was a counterfeit. They're exactly the same, remember, with the ten virgins. Five were genuine Five were counterfeit because both these parables represent the visible church. They represent people like us. They represent people, both parables, people who claim to be part of the state, as it were, uh, people who claim to have lamps, uh, people who claim to love and follow Jesus, people outwardly associated with the kingdom of God. But the point in both parables is that within the visible church, there will be both genuine and counterfeit followers of Jesus, wheat and tares, wise builders, foolish builders, uh, sheep and goats, as we'll discover next week. And I just love the master's response to the two servants who maximize their talents. He says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, good and successful servant. Not well done, good and popular servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Oh my goodness, can you imagine one day hearing those words from Jesus? Looking Jesus in the eye and hearing those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You maximized your life for the glory of God. You used your resources, your opportunities, your talents, your gifts, your abilities to serve me, to serve others, to advance the kingdom of God. You didn't waste your life on peripheral things. Well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Friends, that statement from Jesus is so much higher, so much better than any accolade or any award we could ever receive from a worldly perspective. But what about the third servant? Let's get back to him. Look at verse 24, an incredibly tragic and a sad, sad verse. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered. I was afraid, went out, hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. This man clearly thought he knew the master. He thought he was a servant. He thought he was part of the estate. 
but two things betray him. Did you pick them up? Two things betray the servant. Number one, he produced absolutely nothing, i.e. he produced zero fruit, completely unfruitful, completely unprofitable. Now, genuine, authentic servants, the Bible says, do bear fruit. In fact, that's one of the hallmarks of a cross follower, a spirit filled follower of Jesus. Fruit is an overflow of a deep abiding relationship with the master. Remember the words of Jesus in John 15, 5? I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. You can't know the master, you can't be connected to the master and live a fruitless, unproductive life like this servant did. Clearly he did not know the master, he was not connected to the master in the way that the first two servants were. But the second thing that betrays this unfaithful servant is he doesn't understand the character of the master. He doesn't understand exactly who the master is. Because look how he describes the master. He says, Master, I know you to be a hard man. Hmm? A hard man. That word hard in the original language means unforgiving, unrelenting, unmerciful, unkind. Does that sound like a man who knows Jesus? Who could ever describe Jesus as hard? unkind, unrelenting, ungracious. Well, only someone who has never really met him. I knew you to be a hard man, unrelenting, unforgiving. So I took all that you had given me and I hid it in the ground. I buried your talent. I wasted my opportunity. Yeah, you can have it back, master. Friends, how tragic is that? Wasted potential wasted opportunity, a wasted life. The master responds, how? Well, look at verse 26. The master responds, you wicked, lazy servant. As a bare minimum, you could have given my money to the bankers and earned some interest, but you did absolutely nothing. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has produced something. Give it to the one who's been productive and fruitful. Give it to the one who has got 10 bags. Give it to that faithful person, that person I can trust with responsibility, that person who uses the opportunities, who maximizes their gifts and abilities, and most importantly, that person who makes the most of their spiritual opportunities. So friends, as we wrap it up today, let me challenge you as I challenge myself. What does that bag of gold represent in your life today? What are you sitting with? What has God entrusted to you in all these different areas of life? Are you being a faithful steward with what God has entrusted to you? Are you anticipating one day crossing the finish line, looking the master in the eye and hearing the words, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You took what I've given you and you maximized it for the glory of God, for the benefit of others, and for the extension of my kingdom. Don't forget verse 13, the bridge between these two parables. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour of his coming. Friends, let's get out there. And let's maximize our lives. Let's maximize our talents, our bag of gold for the glory of God. May God bless you. I hope that encouraged you. And we'll do it next week for part four. Until then, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus.